Hey everyone, how are you doing out there? It's landscape day. It's land so we have Sandy here. It's Matt from drawingtutorialsonline.com. Uh, Sandy's here. Hey Sandy, how are you? Good to see you here today. Jessica is here. Cool. Okay. So, wonderful. So what I like to do for you guys here today is I'm just going to give a, a couple more minutes for people to join. Uh, landscapes are not everybody's favorite, uh, but actually, before I go on, Sandy, how is uh, your sound for you guys out there? Dimas, Sekula, everything is going good. Hi, Aurora. I should move this over here, actually. Hey, Ileana. So, Ileana, sound sounds good to you? Everybody, sound sounds good to you guys? Ruka is here. Awesome. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Ileana. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Aurora. So let, let, let's get started. I don't want to go too long today with today's podcast or podcast. <laughs> I don't want to go too long today with today's live stream. Um, the focus of today's live stream is going to be about landscape drawing and in particular, five separate techniques that I think is really going to help you. OK, and what you're looking at and, and it's it's hard doing the live streams technically with a horizontal image like this. It's actually much easier to do it when we're working with a, a vertical image. And um, I tried my best to set it up so you can see the landscape uh, painting. Uh, this is a landscape painting that you see on your monitor by Kenyon Cox. And I have a link in the description below. Hey, Carmela. Um, Bats is here. Uh, absolutely. So. Uh, yes, in the description below, you're going to find the link to the two paintings that I'm going to uh, draw and analyze here for you today. I'd like to go an hour with this, maybe tops, hour and 15 minutes. I don't want to go too long. I mean, the landscape stuff is a little bit easier. It's not really about trying to be perfect with proportions and all of that stuff. I find, hey, Joseph, I find that doing landscape stuff is a, a little easier than doing the other stuff. So um, about five techniques I want to share with you. And just uh, as a prerequisite, with this since we're set up in, in a completely different way than what we have been doing in terms of the images and the verticalness versus the horizontalness. Hi, Nancy. Uh, hi, Aura. Uh, remember, I have major, major, major distortion from the camera. And, and the reason for this, and I repeat it every week, and uh, just bear with me for repeating it in case there's any newcomers. Uh, if the camera, if there was gonna be no distortion on this square, uh, then the camera would be right where my eyes are. But the camera's not. It's off to the side, and that creates distortion. And so it gets a little tapered. You can see that in my studio, this is perfectly level. But on your monitor, it's it's really crooked. And I, I just want you to be aware of that because I'm, I'm a stickler for having things be straight and, and uh, level, and this is not. So it kind of drives me a little cuckoo. So that's just like my little uh, anal retentiveness coming through there. Okay, so let's get started. So what are we looking at? So on the top right of your monitor, what we're looking at is this beautiful but yet simple painting. It's it's a landscape painted paint painting painted in I believe 1883 by a really cool artist Kenyon Cox, and uh, it's simple. And that's what I wanted to start off with you. Hey Anna, it, it it's just very simple. So the first thing that you want to do, let, let's say um, you were going to try to do a study. Make sure I don't get my head in, in this today. Uh, let's say you were going to try to do a study of this landscape. The first thing that I would do here is, Gwen, how are you? You got it, Gwen. I like that name, Gwen. It's so cool. All right. So the first thing that I'm going to do here is just draw my border. Now, this is an extremely, extremely vertical image, and it's it's much more vertical than what, what I have here. Okay. Um, hey, Michael. So, yeah, all right, much more vertical. I made it a little bit taller. And so step number one, 
make your border, okay? The border is going to house your image, okay? Very, very important. Um, yeah, I probably will never do a setup for, uh, I, I'll probably never show how I set up for live streams just because I consider myself an amateur uh, videographer. So I, I'll stick to the drawing. <laughs> I'll stick to the drawing. I'm a total amateur videographer. I'm more of a professional artist. So step number one, draw your border. Step number two, um, now start to think about big blocks of land. Now, usually when we do portraits and, and we usually, uh, when we do the figure, we usually think about big blocks of value. But in, in this particular case, you really want to think about, hey, Marie, big blocks of land. So what was easy for me to uh, do here first is to just try to draw uh, the land over here um, where it separates from the sky. So I'm going to call that um, sky shape would be, I guess, shape number one. And then uh, just like when we draw a portrait, shape of hair, shape of face, um, then I'm going to come on down and this, I just kind of freehanded this right before the video. Uh, just to kind of give the camera something to focus on. So where does the land start over here? So it starts right about here. It's not at the corner of the image. It's right about here. Again, this is really crooked on your monitor. I apologize for that. And so I'm going to come on up. Cool. And then I'm going to come up to this tree on the far right. So we have the sky is first shape. This area of land is second shape. This is third shape. And then the foreground piece of the land right over here, big chunks of land, you want to think about this. We're going to call this shape number four. So when you look at this, there, there's a lot. And, and what a lot of people will get caught up with is brushwork and the tr little like small tree in, in the foreground, the, the sapling over there. And then we look at the trees. It, it's more of an impressionistic uh, loose painting. It's not this realistic thing. And it, it's kind of cool. So you, you want to try to first think about big chunks of land within the shape. So we're analyzing and we're also talking about drawing at the same time. Okay. Now, the lay of the land. This is really important. So the lay of the land for me, it actually, I, I don't want to go too dark with this because I, I want to shade next. So the lay of the land curves around. So you don't want to think flat. You want to think curvy. So this is curving around that slopey hill. Okay, it slopes down. And over here, it slopes down as well. Okay, this is really neat for you to experiment with doing this to see. Just like when we draw the figure, I talk about all the time. Um, you want to look for lines that wrap around the figure. This creates three-dimensional form. Well, the same thing with the landscape. You want to draw these lines that wrap around your landscape. And again, if you want to try this with me, uh, go in the description right below the video. Go to the Kenyon Cox. You can download the, this painting. It's such a big file. It's really awesome. Uh, it's from Wik Wikipedia Commons, I do believe. So it's in the public domain, and it's, it's nice. So... Over here, we're going to find the lay of the land. So you're just kind of envisioning that you're on this hill and what direction would the hill kind of flow in? Now, there's many, many different ways to do this, right? Um, you can have 10 people do this and it'll look 10 different ways. And that's the beautiful thing about being an artist. Uh, everyone's going to have their own different perspective on things. And then you can see that I already have the lay of the land on, on the third. Now, if we were going to do lay of land on the sky, how would you do it? Well, for me, it would just be vertical straight up and down the sky. Okay. And, and that's really, really interesting to think of it that way. Now, first thing, if you're analyzing slash doing a study of your uh, a painting, any painting that you really like on the internet, First thing is draw the exact size or close to the exact size border. Second thing is start to think about big chunks of things, I would like to call them. Uh, in this particular case, it's big chunks of like these hills. So uh, we have three kind of hills and there's a little one way back over here. Do you see that light blue right over here where my pencil is? It's a distant hill, which is actually a little bit lower than what I have. 
Uh, but it's all good. You know, I'm not going to worry about being exact with my proportions. Now, now we start to think about the third thing. And this is really repetitive. You know, if I'm teaching somebody how to draw hands, or if I'm teaching somebody how to draw a portrait, or the figure, or a still life, or an interior uh, in, 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 your, in your home, and you're going to draw this, uh, yeah, there are certain things that you want to focus on with an interior like perspective, but it's always going to go back to the same things that I teach over and over and over again. And the next step would just be values. So everybody, when you work, should have a value scale just like this uh, nearby when you're working because the hallmark of doing this type of stuff, notice how the paper got so much whiter when I put the grayscale here. See that? And now when I take the grayscale away, it gets so much darker, the paper. Not too much, not too much. So when you photograph drawings on white paper, this is just a side note. It's all education here today. <laughs> um, hey, Craig. Yeah, it's really, it's very beautiful palette. I knew you'd like that. Even though I know landscapes are not your thing. We, we got to try to fit everyone's needs in here on this uh, on this live stream. So everybody needs to work with a grayscale, whether you buy this really inexpensive one from Amazon or a local art supply store, or you make your own like this one I, I made way, way back in college and, and I still have it. Uh, it's survived all these years. Actually, this was after college. Okay. And that's a story for another day. Uh, make sure that you have the values. Now, if you don't have a value scale, what you could do is you can give yourself a key. So I'm going to say, all right, I don't have a value scale, but I know that's black. Okay, right there. That's my key. I know that's a middle tone. And let's just do a light, 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 light value right here. So that's going to be my three values. So that's going to be my key moving forward. Now, this is fairly small, this piece. So it should not take me too long to shade. We're about seven inches wide. This is tiny. So this is by four inches tall. This is more like a study here today and not necessarily a finished drawing. So what we want to do is I'm looking at my notes. So we're on values. Okay. So what I'm going to do very quickly here, and I'm going to hold my pencil this way. So this is the way that I like to hold my pencil. Like I'm writing a letter. Okay. But in order for me to shade very quickly, I just started doing this last week and, and, and it helped me um, to shade very quickly. And now we're going to get rid of the lay of the land. I'm not going to match my values perfectly. Uh, again, I, this week I did coaching with six different individuals. And almost every single person to uh, a person, I talked about sh shading in a solid way. It is the biggest thing that gives people heartache is shading in a solid way. And I, I will mention this in every single live stream that I do because this is, I, I feel like it's the simplest thing. So like for your health, right? What is the simplest thing to do? Well, people just say, drink a lot of water. Okay, that's a simple thing that you can do. What's a really, uh, another simple thing that you can do for your health? Well, walk around the block for Pete's sakes. That, that's a move. Uh, get, you know, your muscles moving. Don't, don't sit in a chair all day like what I usually do. So those are two really simple things for your health. Go for a walk and drink tons of water, right? It's not that hard, but a lot of people don't do that, and including me sometimes. Sometimes I forget to drink water, and sometimes I never go for a walk. So with shading and with your artwork, one of the most fundamental things that you can do that will drastically change, and I know this is a broken record, but I still see people do it. With the six people that I did the coaching with this week, they all need to shade more in a solid way. So that would be my first block in. So am I going this black? No, absolutely not, I'm not. I'm gonna keep it a little bit lighter for now. I'm gonna try a different pencil. Um, the very thin and that shades a little bit blacker than this color color race and then I'm just kind of coming on in over here I'm not mind mind you this guys is a drawing that is an educational drawing it, it is not a finished drawing so I'm, I'm not worried about the lines for the lay of the land so right now I'm just trying to get my darks in and now they're not true dark but I've got to start somewhere okay and we're gonna clarify this little shape as a dark now, let's, um, 
I'm going to come back to that. Let's get in. Let's block in now solid shape our light middle tone, or let's just call it a middle tone. Okay, because there's there's a few more things actually. There's like three uh, more things that are really valuable to landscape um, scenery, and and you can apply this to your interior drawings as well. Okay, so I am just right now drawing like a painter, and this is very important for you to try this. Just just experiment today. Take an hour out of your Saturday. I really appreciate you joining me here. And just try to do this quick. Think of it as like a thumbnail sketch. Don't worry about it being so perfect. Now this, what's lighter? You ask yourself the question, hey, boy, that's a really cool name. Kain, Kain, Kano? Kano. I'm going to say it that way. So what is lighter? This foreground mass of land or the sky? Definitely the foreground is one value darker than the sky. So I'm going to just try my very best to block in. Now, notice my pencil stroke direction. So in landscape drawing, pencil stroke direction is going to give you different textures. And in this particular case, this painting is so loose, but yet so atmospheric. And the brush stroke direction, if you really pay attention to it, it's going straight up and down. And what we have here in the foreground and what the artist is trying to emulate is the texture of the tall grass, okay? It's really quite beautiful, and it's just very suggestive. Suggestive. Good, 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 good. I just um, last night finished Marco Polo on Netflix for the second time. I introduced my wife to it, and she really got into it, and then we read that it was canceled on Netflix. And the last episode in season two was a cliffhanger and it just it sucked that they're not going to uh, renew it that was such a good um, series on netflix so what you can see here is uh we've blocked in values now is is the dark this part as dark as my grayscale no it's not but i'm gonna just i'm gonna wait and i, I i'm gonna shade a little bit more i want to talk to you about a couple of different things okay so let's recap so far, we talked about the importance of the border, okay? Now, my border's crooked, and for you latecomers, it's crooked because it's the camera angle. It's straight in my studio, okay? So draw a border for your landscape. Very crucial, okay? Second thing, think of big chunks of land, and different things are going to have different values, Okay, you don't like one of the worst things that I see people do, and I'll, I'll draw it right down over here, is they'll do a little thumbnail sketch. Okay, I, I, I see this all the time with my students when we work on landscape stuff. Let, let me raise that a little bit. Yep, right here, very low. Let me back up a touch. And they do a line for the land versus the sky, and they put a couple things on the land. And then they put some clouds in the sky, and basically the land and the sky are the same value. That's the quickest way to ruin a landscape drawing. You want to have different things have different values. You want to write down that sentence because it is so, so... Um, thank you, Kano. Kano, cool. I hope I... Yeah, Kano. I like that. That's so nice. You, you definitely want to write down that sentence. Different things should have different values. Now, I, I think that should apply for everything that you draw. So if you're drawing a portrait, um, different things have different values. So the shadow should be slightly different value than the hair. The hair should be slightly different value than the background tone. The background tone should be a slightly different value than the, than the face. And it, it sounds so first grade, but... First grade's an important grade, right? It's when you learn how to, how to read and write. And it's, it's just such a fundamental thing. So write down that sentence for me. Different things should have different values. Now, um, in every landscape, just almost stabbed myself with the pencil. These, these things are really sharp. Um, in every landscape that you draw, you want to have it act like... Um, there needs to be something that takes the viewer on a journey. Now, if you're a member of DTO, which most of you guys are members of DTO because I only sent out um, the email to notify everybody about the live stream to members of DTO. And if you're a member, you know about the uh, Masterclass series. And in some of the Masterclass uh, lessons, I, I, I talk about this 
entrance and this journey that you take through a landscape. Now, the journey is going to be different for everybody. But when I look at this, I, I kind of look at this little sapling right over here. See if I can't get it in the right place. So I, I look at this first because the foreground is so very empty. And I see this like little sapling over here. And then for some reason, I kind of come on down. Now, everyone's going to be different. So yeah, don't hold me to it. Uh, you can take a different journey. So this is our journey right here. We zig, Z-I-G, we zig, and then we zag, Z-A-G, we zag, and we're off to that background. Now, it could also be that Kenyon Cox, the artist, wanted us to start over here on the top. You see where I'm drawing right now? So he could have wanted us to come along the ridge line of this beautiful hill. It's so pretty with the trees and all that. And we come on down and we see that far off outcropping of land miles and miles and miles away over here. You guys see that in that photo of the painting. And then we zig back into the foreground all the way back down over here. And then we come up to the saplings and then back to the background. So it doesn't matter whether you... Uh, start from the foreground first or you start from the background first. It's your image and you get to decide the journey that you want the viewer to take in your landscape painting, okay? Or drawing or digital painting, whatever you're doing. So just think about zig, zag, zig on a journey, okay? And I'm just going to put some arrows over here. Now, in this country here in the United States, for landscape pieces and your journey. This is the future, uh, the right side of the piece. Let me resharpen that. Such a brute today with, with the pencil. What an ugly letter F. My God, that is disgusting. Okay, so that is our future. Jeez, that's so ugly. And this is our past. Okay, so if you zig this way, then this way, then you zig that way, did it again. <laughs> uh, you're zigging the viewer. You're taking the viewer on a journey that is just so awfully ugly um, into the past. And this has major significance in storytelling, especially um, if you have a person in your scene. So if the person is looking to the right side of your image, they are looking into the future. So maybe they're looking into the future. There's some hope for the person. Maybe they're looking into their past and they're thinking about something that went right or they're thinking about something that went wrong or they're thinking about, you know, a pivotal moment. And the same thing applies for a simple landscape piece like this. OK, um, so think about that if you employ that thing called the zigzag. OK, so I, I, I'm going to just catch this out a little bit. So. First thing right over here, we're just going to call this our frame. Get the frame in. Number two, lay of the land. Okay. Number three, values. Really important. And now what we're talking about. Now, within all of these, I'm just abbreviating so you guys can write down some notes. So we have um, start with the frame. Think about the lay of the land, big chunks of land, especially in a landscape. Assign those chunks of land different values. Different things have different values. Then think about, um, let's just write the word journey, that you're going to take the viewer when uh, the viewer looks at, at, at your landscape piece. Now, with the journey, how do you begin the journey? How do you begin that? How do you know where to start? Well, you start with uh, contrast. Okay, edges. So perhaps um, this is this is kind of a, a, a confusing one for me. Uh, yeah, no doubt. My brain wants to start us here on the foreground, and I want to zig in, and then I want to come over here to the zag. And uh, but Kenyon Cox, this is the hardest edge right over here. Definitely one of the hardest edges in this piece. Hey, Aries, and. Uh, that's where I, I look first. So it's um, there's no absolutes. 
for every masterclass video that I that I teach on the website, every lesson, a, a, every little you know analyze that I do of the images, uh, anyone can second guess what I say. And the reason for that is it's I don't know exactly what was in this artist's brain when he created this painting. I'm not him. He could have had completely different intentions. So what I'm trying to get us all to do together is to have an educated guess as to what the artist was doing. So I'm trying to equip you with these tools so you can analyze images that you really like if you're into landscape drawing. Okay. Now, contrast, remember, is very simple. Contrast is just when we put a dark, dark value right next to a light value. That's where you're going to look. So when you look around where I'm drawing, what do you see? You see this dark, because it's against white paper. You see my ugly letter F, and you see this contrast. And then we look at the landscape, because there's no contrast in the landscape yet. So what I can do later is I can erase this out, erase that out, erase that out, when I start to go like a little bit more contrasty in, in this piece. So these are five really important things. Uh, the other thing that is just a given for me personally is light and shade, okay? And I love to uh, incorporate light and shade in every image that I do. Now, I'm taking an educated guess. When I look at the trees, I can't point because that image is not here. But uh, when I look at the trees, I see that there is a shadow side. So let's just say, for argument's sake, this is a tree, okay? And that's some tree right over there. My God, um, that's the shadow side of the tree right there. And this is the light side of the tree. And with this land coming down, the lay of the land, it wraps around. Um, Kenyon Cox is putting a middle tone over here because the land is rolling down away from the light. So this is more of the shadow part of the field. Okay. And this land is facing the light. Uh, so it, it's catching a, a little bit more light. Now, where else can we discover where the light is coming from in this piece? Well, just look at the clouds, right? So over here, if you analyze this, if you downloaded this, this picture uh, from the description below, you can find the link to download. You see the light and shade over here, right? It's, it's hitting the cloud, and then that's the shadow side of the cloud. And then you see tons of light hitting this cloud over here. So you, you start to take these little things and you start to analyze. Now, it does it look like a really bright, sunny day? Nope, it doesn't. It kind of looks like a little bit of an overcast day. And uh, the artist is going with more of a muted palette. Uh, there's not a lot of yellows in the scene. Uh, uh, what, what, how I would incorporate in a, a sunlight in a landscape is by doing a lot of yellow. So I'd put a little bit of yellow in all of my white paint. And everything that white paint touched would be warm. Okay, and that's how I'd show that sunlight. So why don't we now, in, in the remaining time uh, that we're going to work on this little guy here, is um, try to match some values. L let's just try to be a little bit more exact with some of this. So what I'm going to do now, uh, very quickly, and I'm going to break the pencil probably a gazillion times, is I am simply just going to paint. I'm sorry, let me rephrase what I just said there. I am just going to draw as if I am an impressionistic painter and this live stream today is not about me doing a long drawing with tons of likeness and everything's going to be perfect uh, this is just more about teaching you this is more of a pure teaching live stream today and less about me trying to do a really pretty drawing so it's teaching you these five techniques okay and you should try your very very best to employ these five techniques in just about every landscape that you do. So right now what I'm doing is I'm just blocking in values. Very quickly here, this is the most important thing in my little humble opinion that you should be practicing. Blocking in values. Squint. So when you squint at this landscape, you should see all of this in terms of simplistic values. Now I probably won't be perfect with it. Okay, I'm going to do my best to be as close as I can in this short period of time without putting you all to sleep. But I think what would be really lovely is if you could do this with me, okay? Uh, does anybody have any questions about what I just went through? Now, I do have another landscape, 
um, that I'm going to try to get to here this morning that's a little bit more um, contrast, okay? I, I should, um, after the video, put this in the description. Thank you, Aries. I appreciate that. So I want to keep my pencil strokes direction kind of consistent, going straight up and down. I'm trying to match what the artist did. Okay, and I'm trying to be very solid, and I'm not going to use a brush today. I, I want to just let the pencil do most of the work. Okay, so this is a little dark. Now, uh, my foreground field is very light. Now, Kenyon Cox did everything. He did nudes, he did figures, he did portraits, and if you do a Google search of Kenyon Cox, uh, I, I wouldn't call him one of my favorite artists, but there's a lot of really in interesting uh, images that he does. I, you know, I seem to be really uh, gravitating towards some of his artwork. Not all of it, some of it. And it's, it's really nice. Hey, David, how are you? So, David, we're doing an impressionistic drawing today. We're talking about uh, five things to consider when analyzing and drawing your own landscape, when you're analyzing an, a master's landscape and when you're drawing your own landscape. Yes, uh, same principles would be applied. You know, I, I really, you know, after looking at your artwork, David, I really want to do one one day with a pen. If I, if I had a pen nearby, maybe I would do the next one with a pen as I hit my nose on the microphone. <laughs> Number five says contrast. Yep, contrast. I'll put that in the description below, and if you're members of DTO, this is all going to go on the website, and I'll put a description in, in the course. Now, uh, now comes time where I'm going to switch holding my pencil. I'm going to hold my pencil this way because I'm using the power of my thumb. got a very, very powerful thumb, in case you didn't know, uh, to press down hard very quickly. The goal here is quickness because I know that your time is precious, and I really appreciate you joining me here today. So I'm going to just go a little bit quicker with this. See how hard that thumb, see how strong that thumb is? Just broke that pencil right in half. Okay, so this should be higher. You know, my proportions um, radar is kind of starting to get set all off here because the proportions aren't perfect, but... I just have to ignore that part of my brain and understand that it's just a study and there's no such thing as perfection right now. I just want to really do a quick study for you guys. Now, I, I'm going to use a different pencil in, in a moment here. I know I'm blocking everything. Just bear with me. My whole setup here is shaking because I'm trying to press down really hard and do this quickly for you guys. Now, I also find that my landscapes, I'm going to hold my pencil the normal way now, always get stronger when I do my dark border. This is level on my pad, perfectly level, not level on the monitor. This is really good practice to try to draw straight lines. I'm not worried about my hand smudging. You see my hand? It's loaded with um, pencil right now. Now, I want to just for fun try, where did I put it now? Uh, you can never be uh, so prepared. This is another uh, Prismacolor pencil. It's called Verithin, and I don't use it often. It's very skinny, and, uh, but it, it's a cooler black than the Colorace. I just want to play with it a little bit over here and see if I can't. And, and, it, and it plays nicely with the Colorace, okay? Um, I'm going to work on this one for a few more minutes, and then I'm going to dive into the next one for you guys because the name of the game here today is education. Uh, it's not for me to do a pretty drawing. I could do a little bit with the clouds in the background for you. And this should be a little bit cleaner in terms of the edge. And there's some really cool paths over here as well. There's a lot going on on this hill. 
and I would encourage you to play with it a little bit more if you have time today to do that. This is a, a softer edge, but it's an edge nonetheless. I'm going to go over that edge a little bit more. It gets crisper at the bottom of that little hill. This is really crisp over here. One of the crispest edges in the, in the piece. And now we can just kind of put in some darker values over here. So this is a really fun landscape. Does anybody have any questions? Let's go darker over here. That's why I draw small on these live streams. Yeah, um, portrait drawing, I use gesture all the time in, in portrait drawing. Um, yeah, you better believe it. Now, not every pose will I consider uh, using a, a gesture line in a portrait. Not everyone, but some of them, no doubt. And then I like to use uh, gesture when I draw eyes together. Okay, that's really, really important. Sometimes like a three-quarter four view, you can see somebody's neck kind of flow right into the side of their face, and that's kind of cool. Yeah, um, absolutely. So the, the gesture for me on this landscape piece is right here. So it's cruising on down. That's a gesture line in the landscape. This is a gesture line right here. Uh, these lay of the land lines can be gesture lines, and you can do your pencil strokes with the lay of the land lines. So you see how quickly we did that? And is it anything to write home to mom about? No, it's just, it's just a lot of pencil on the paper. So now what you would do if this is your piece is you would most definitely have fun with it and, and render it out and see if you can't make a really pretty landscape and, and draw all those little trees in, in the background. Now, let's talk about the clouds. So the clouds, very horizontal. Let me use the color race for the clouds. Okay, now, that's too way too dark. So they're just very horizontal and extremely light. And if this was done on toned paper, I would be using the white charcoal over here. Okay. Now, one could say that you put a value in the sky that's lighter than everything else, and I'm just going to use a horizontal. Okay, there's a little bit of a darker cloud right over here. Very faint. Okay. And this is not pure white. After looking 10 minutes on the reference photo, my eyes always go back to those little trees on the background hill. Yeah, you know, the more I um, look at this piece, so now I maybe what you want to do if you're going to draw along with me over here is that you would um, create some hard edges over here. How you doing, sir, my man? Sheer, my man. Yeah, these trees over here, which I just got that one wrong. It's all good. And then this one. And then these tall trees over here. No doubt. So a little bit of edge detail goes a long way. Okay, so any questions on this one before I put this one to bed and we move on to the next one? And we analyze another one and we draw one more. So we just have a lot of circular shapes here with the trees. So landscape drawing is about big chunks of value. Now, when I look at this and I squint, I think I want to make this one value darker. 
I want it darker than the sky. And this is making a big deal for me right now. Yeah, you can use a brush for this. It's just such a small little sketch, and my hand has already smudged it so much that I'm not going to bother with the brush today on this one. Okay, uh, so that making the ground one value darker helped me tremendously with this. Okay, and because it's making this, whether this is a representation of it's a, there's a little bit of rock on this hill, I'm not quite sure. Okay, so I'm going to leave it there with this because, again, I'm not doing a drawing today where I'm going to make it look perfect. It's just about these five things. Draw your frame. Think about the lay of the land, just like you think about the lay of the land with a figure. Put, give each lay of the land a different value. Take the viewer on a journey, a zigzag, and use contrast to control where the viewer looks first, second, and third. So when I look at this piece, two of the hardest, hardest edges are right here, where I'm drawing right now, as well as these dark trees right over here. So it's interesting. Again, I don't know what was in Kenyon Cox's brain at the time he did this piece. Uh, he could have had, he may not even have been thinking about that. Who knows? But it's something that you must think about with your landscapes. You don't want to just go into your landscapes willy-nilly and just put in contrast anywhere and just let, leave it up for the viewer to decide where they're going to go first, second, and third. And then the other little tidbit that we talked about here today is things on the facing towards the right bring the viewer into the future. Their eyes, you know, so be very conscious of that when you're doing your zigzag to future on the right, past and on the left. That's a big deal for telling stories. Cool. Okay, so that's my little sketch. It's an impressionistic sketch. I recommend doing this all the time. How do you get that nice long point on the color erase pencil? At risk of destroying everything, can this come over to my camera? Something just already dropped on the floor. Panasonic. <laughs> it's like a shark coming up. It's a shark coming up. Donna, 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 Donna. So this thing. Now, if I told you how old this pencil sharpener was, I think you would probably fall down. You, you would fall down. Because this thing, it's old. It's, it's old. It's over 20 years old. I like to keep my stuff, well, there's some scratches on it. It is so old. It is 20 years old, and it is still sharpened. They don't make this anymore. I have another one for the classroom, but it's like the new politically correct type of pencil sharpener. It does not sound effects. The new politically correct sharpener will not sharpen the pencil as sharp as this one does in case you fall down. I mean, if you fall down with the pencil, it's still going to stab you and kill you with the new sharpener. But this thing is like beyond... Um, now, if I was to use this thing, I would just give up. I, I, I would just give up. If I'm going to sharpen my pencils with this, there's not a chance. There's not a chance. So if I go to the Verithin, and then I've got to use my, uh, you know, my cup with the crumbs in here, it's just not going to happen. And if I start to sharpen with this thing, it's just going to make a, a nightmare. And I've seen students, that this is a true story, okay? Let me put this with the sharpener crumbs. Um, I've seen students come into my class in first year of college, and they have a pencil sharpener like this, and they've had this same pencil sharpener since like sixth grade. And they don't realize that this is just a little razor blade in here, and every time they sharpen their pencil, like the razor blade is so dull that it just cracks the pencil. So one of the first things that I tell the students to do when they join my class is to get a new pencil sharpener because they've had the same one and they never think to replace it. But um, this thing, this Panasonic pencil sharpener, is just a gift from God, and uh, it still works. And I need they don't sell them anymore. But I, I need to find to maybe buy another one somehow, some way. I've had coaching students that I've sent to go buy one. They buy them on eBay. So I'm probably ruining it for myself. All of you guys are going to go buy them on eBay now. There's going to be no more left. Okay. 
So let's move on. I, I like a long point on my pencil. I do not like a short point. So when I get pencils brand new from the art supply store like this one, um, it's a short point. Now, this, is a, this pencil is a different beast for me because I only do gesture drawing with this one on newsprint. And um, with this, I don't sharpen with the Panasonic because I only use this in my classroom. So I, get, I buy brand new sharpeners all the time and in my classroom. I don't care. The, the shavings go on the floor. The, the classroom's a mess anyways. Okay, so I'm going to move this now and we're going to do another one. Actually... Let me get a new sheet of paper. And let's do one more for you. Cool. So now the camera is going to freak out. It's going to have nothing to focus on. So I need to be fast about this. Now, let me show you one thing here. Um, I did this yesterday for a coaching student. I have a stack of color studies right? So every single time uh, I would do a book cover, I would do a color study. And this would take me like 20 minutes to do, sometimes a half an hour to do. Uh, sometimes I would go really crazy and spend a little bit of extra time with the color study. And uh, so I, and this is, uh, as you can see, a landscape and different things have different values, right? Uh, and it's, it's very muddy. And, and actually with that one, I did too color studies because I was a lunatic. Um, so this one's a color study. So for every painting, not every painting, that would be a lie. For the paintings that I had extra time with where they were important to me, I would always do a color study like this in my oil paint. Number one, to figure out what colors I was going to use, physically what colors I was going to use, and technically the values. Now, let me show you one more here. This one's very old. So with this one, uh, it's these two kids on a magic carpet. And so on the left, this is so old. Uh, on the left, you would see my three value study done in paint. That is a thumbnail sketch in paint. And then I have my all value study in values. And then I do my color study, right? And I, I think this is really, really important that um, you think about doing this. So quick question about gesture drawing. Is it okay to make the gesture exaggerated or should I follow the gesture of the model? It, that completely depends on your style. It completely depends on what you like. And uh, if you're like a, a Mike Matisse guy who has the book Force, well, then everything's going to be exaggerated. Uh, sometimes I'll exaggerate. Sometimes I won't. It, it's all about what you're trying to accomplish with your gesture drawings. For me, gesture drawings are a way to practice drawing the figure very quickly uh, so then when I do like a two hour drawing, I can see the proportions just like that. And sometimes I like to exaggerate and sometimes I don't. Um, so I was doing, uh, everything is so horizontal right now, so I can't really show you a vertical. Uh, so I was just doing like a quick sketch as I was talking on the phone with somebody yesterday. So I was just doing a, a quick gesture for warming up and I exaggerated the legs on this little figure, no doubt about it. So yeah, exaggeration is, 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 is important. So Let's do the next one. Let me see if I can be really fancy here. And hopefully my mics don't. So here's, here's our next little landscape. Okay. And uh, you can see it, it's a little bit more detailed. Can you hear me clearly right now? I, I need somebody to let me know that. And I'll ask um, Aurora. Aurora, can you hear me quickly or do you, uh, clearly? Or do you hear like an echo or anything right now? Is the sound the same? Oh, you just bought one on eBay. <laughs> My um, treasure trove is going to be gone. Um, you guys can hear me okay still? I know there's a delay. Thank you, Phoenix. Okay. So this painting, thank you, Liz, um, this painting that you see here is, uh, thank you, thank you, okay. This painting that you see is from one of my most favorite. A light source is, Kathleen, a light source is everything in a landscape, in my opinion. 
Okay. Just looking at some of your comments. Why, thank you, Aurora, why is um, a light source so vital to a landscape painting? A light source is so vital to a landscape painting because it sets the time of the day. And time of the day is, is vital to telling a story, uh, to creating a mood, because the time of the day at sunset is completely different than just a few minutes later at twilight when the sun just went down and there's just a little extra white light left. Um, there was another landscape that I was going to do that was twilight, but it was too muted. So I think uh, this, um, the first landscape that you saw, it seemed to me that it was kind of an overcast day. Uh, this uh, landscape that you're seeing now from one of my favorite landscape painters, Isaac Leviton, is, wow, we're already 50 minutes in. Oh my God. So let me get drawn here. Um, I'm going to draw a little smaller on this one. So let me just kind of map it out. This should be perfectly horizontal. This actually isn't that small. So for me to do this quickly, seven inches with this little pointy pencil, So this on my drawing pad, my piece of paper, is perfectly level, but not on your monitor. Okay, now let, let's talk about this scene. So let me move my photo reference so I can see it. I, I love this, and, and again, that's really small on the video. I, I, I apologize. It doesn't look that bad, actually. Um, Isaac Leviton, go to wikiart.org. His name is spelled, it's a really tricky name, I-S-A-A-C. If you just start typing in I-S-A-A-C, Leviton, L-E-V-I-T-A-N will pop up. And he lived till about 40. He was a Russian painter. And uh, I feel as though that he was one of the last best landscape painters ever. There's like... I. I think like 400 paintings of his there. And those are the ones on Wikipedia, uh, wikiart.org. Can you imagine all the ones that were not photographed? And for all those paintings, he did them. He, he was so young. He died at 40. That is crazy. So I chose this painting because um, it takes us on a little journey. And um, it, it's pretty, it's, it's a really beautiful painting. So uh, I got something in my eye. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Okay, love this. Gotta love the live stream when you get something in your eye. <laughs> okay, here we go. I'm gonna tough it out. I'm gonna tough it out. So now this little hut or house or dwelling, whatever you wanna say, uh, I can go to Craig for all of the different words because Craig is a writer and he would know all of the different words. Uh, he's probably a walking thesaurus. Now, I'm looking at the bottom of my painting to the top of that dwelling to the top of the sky, okay? And I uh, should leave myself a little bit of fudge factor over here, but let's not be perfect with it. Let's just draw. Okay, so we have this tree. Love this piece so much. Now we have um, a big chunk of land. Let's see, this should be lower. My frame is not the same size as that piece. That's why I'm, I think I'm struggling. Um, this is like a wagon wheel rut in the ground. So this is a big, massive area for me right here. And now we have another rut in this road from a wagon wheel. What is so very, very interesting about looking at these old, late 1800 Isaac Leviton paintings is Coffee or tea? Yeah, coffee. Um, is that you discover how roads were made. Like when you look around where you live, maybe not in the city, but maybe in like the suburbs, um, and you ask yourself the question, who knew where to make these first roads? And it's where you see these footpaths. Uh, so right over here, we see this like little footpath. And that footpath is taking us on a little journey, okay? And that's how roads were made. And, and you see it zigs up. So what am I doing here? I'm drawing the lay of the land. So you see over here, this road starts to zig up. And then this comes across. 
and I'm squinting to get my measurements. This should all be a little bit lower. So this is gesture, guys. You guys ask me about gesture. What I'm doing right now is gesture. So this is a very long gesture line for the landscape. Okay. I, I wish I could make this straight. This is driving me cuckoo. See how that's crooked? That should not be crooked on the video camera. Okay, Matt, shut up about it and just draw. Okay, that drives me nuts. Because uh, I, I, I feel as though you guys are saying that he's drawing in your mind. If you're a newcomer, you're like, he's drawing crooked. Um, this should be lower. This is gesture. So when I'm drawing this landscape, I am drawing big chunks of value, big chunks of land. This would be the same identical thing I would be doing if I was doing a portrait drawing. Shape of hair, shape of face is big chunks, okay? Chunk is not my favorite word. Uh, it's a very funny word. I'm not, I'm going way too big with this. Okay, yep, that's way too big and way too to the left. So let me not be so anal retentive about my proportions but it's something that I like to practice in every drawing that I do because I feel if I practice proportions in every drawing that I do, I'll keep getting better and better and better with it. Okay, so now we have this mid-ground. Oh, is that continuous line technique that you teach on your pre- Yes. So what I'm doing here is I'm trying to do my very best to keep my pencil on the paper. So we have a low-lying tree over here. I'm kind of screwed because uh, my proportions are off. The sky needs to be higher, but I can't really make the sky too much higher. And now we have this tree. Yeah, you can feel the perfectionism. Uh, so can my wife. She can feel the perfectionism uh, in everything that I do, and it probably drives her a little crazy. Um, so if you live with a perfectionist, it's just, yeah, God bless you. Let's see here. So let's come on up. Let's come on up, and I'm just having fun. This is so much fun doing these landscapes because I love this, all this. Um, uh, yeah, it's really good, the sharpener. So everything, I'm going to pay attention to my border. Pay attention to my border. Now, oh, okay, I use my brain. Let's lower this. We need more sky. Make sure it's parallel with everything. Okay. I'm really a stickler for that. So when you guys photograph your artwork, make sure that your camera is level and plumb. So your photograph when you photograph your artwork for critique, we did a podcast on this uh, a couple weeks ago, that you photograph your drawing level and plumb and not angled. So you see what I did there? I just raised that sky that is terribly crooked on your monitor, fairly straight on my drawing pad. Okay, now, so this, Craig, some landscapes are more like portraits. I've been looking at the portraits, uh, Poplars by Monet, and they are portraits of trees for sure. And the grain stacks, by the way, doesn't use any white in showing snow. Hmm, I got to check those out. All righty, now let's get these houses over here, these dwellings. So we're going to just wing this. We're not going to be perfect with it. What did I just say? <laughs> Okay, let's do that. Ch test that eraser. Make sure it's not going to be a dry one. Okay, now we have this tree over here. Uh, we have a lay of land. So this is a lay of land. See this? This is gesture. This is important. This is a foot path, wagon path here. Now we have the base of the dwellings over here. We have an opening. Some of the best landscape painters leave an opening in their landscape to enable the landscape to go back for miles. 
and that's what you're seeing over here. It almost looks as though this could be distant water over here or a distant hill, very far off hill that is very, very light middle tone. Okay, that's our opening, very important. And that is very blue over there. And what is overlapping that very blueness is the orange of the trees, the orange brown. So we've got a little perspective. All of the this aspect of the roof line is very level because we're very close to the horizon line. I haven't talked about perspective in this one. We'll save perspective for another one, but I'm thinking about perspective right now. I'm just going to put in a little value over here because don't wait until you're into your drawing an hour to start using shape because shape is a valuable asset that you want to use very early on in just about everything that you do. Now, um, different things have different values. So we have this very blue green here, and then there is a cast shadow from another dwelling that is casting across over here. Yep, and it goes up this hill. So lay of the land goes across the footpath and it angles down. Good. So now I'm going to do the shading here with perspective lines going with the lay of the land. It gets darker over here. This is a very dark cast shadow. So again, guys, if you've joined me late here today, today's drawing is not about doing a realistic drawing for six hours today. It's This is all about teaching. And the, the fundamentals that I'm teaching um, are values, journey, lay of the land. We're, we're incorporating more and more gesture into the mix. So let's block this in. Block it in. Okay, now I'm not using the brush because right now my hand is smudging what I've already blocked in. Okay, and I, I'm cool with that. I'm, I'm cool with that. It's just a study. So I'm kind of being a little bit messy here. I'm not worried about perfection. Okay, so we have one side of the tree is catching light. And there's a little like rooster over there, I think, or a chicken. Very funny. And we have our footpath. We don't want to destroy that value. And we have the foreground land. Yeah, you got to squint. So um, when we look at this piece, you, you notice that first, that's I'm going with a middle tone. So this is crucial. I still have something in my eye as I scratch my eyelid. Um, this is crucial that here's another little footpath. That is so interesting. Um, right here, that little light, and then the ground over here is all, like you can just tell right in the mid ground, so many people are like walking on this path. It's a heavy, heavy traffic, trafficked path. So do most of the beginning part of your art with middle tones, okay? Squint, and then as you progress, you start to press down hard. Um, I always, Aries, I always use the same pencil. I always just use the color raised pencil. Um, there's no, it's just one value. If I'm using a mechanical pencil is what you see here. Uh, it's like an HP and a mechanical pencil would be really good for this as well. Uh, I, I, I like to teach and, and a lot of people don't like this because there's a lot of people that follow my website, drawingtutorialsonline.com. There are members and a lot of people who are members of my website. And I'm not trying to sound like a, like, uh, an idiot. I'm just being realistic. People who join my website are really into learning how to draw. So part of learning how to draw is buying art supplies. And some people, and they will go unnamed and you know who you are, are addicted to buying art supplies. And why is that? Because buying art supplies gives you a high. It's fun. Uh, who doesn't like to go to the art supply store and buy a boatload of art supplies? Everybody does. I, I love buying stuff there too. 
the thing that I do is I just buy the same supplies over and over and over again because my experimentation days are, are done. I've done my experimentation and I know what works best for me and what I get the best results with. So this is just like a side note. Don't spend years experimenting. At some point, you need to commit to sticking with a set of art supplies that gets you good results. Okay. Nancy, is that you? You're addicted to buying art supplies or do you have a question? Yeah, who I, I mean, who who doesn't like buying new stuff? Come on. Everybody loves that. So I, I'm I just lowered the piece. Yes, Phoenix, it is much easier to practice um, black and white. And if I come over here and I get my studies. So for every study that I would do for a book cover, so this was a horror book cover of this girl and there was like this villain back over there. So that would be my three value study for that painting. Then I would do an all value study for that painting. And then I would do a color swatch study for the painting. And this is how you practice. And this is how you set up your value structure. And you can just do the whole thing with this grayscale. Okay. And you arrange your piece according to the values that you have here. And I, I can't tell you how very, very crucial that is to the success of your paintings, of your drawings, of your watercolors, of your pastels, of your digital art. And people who don't take the time to practice matching values uh, will always struggle with their artwork, no matter what. Now, it's not about copying photos. That's not what I'm talking about. It's about being in control of your scene. So if you want to do more of a stylized portrait, or if you want to do more of a stylized landscape, uh, you don't have to match values, but you need to be able to manipulate them. And how are you able to manipulate them? By practicing matching them. It has that, yeah, because they don't make it anymore. Yep. Yeah, so when, when you look at, I, I'm speaking, um, I, I understand I'm speaking in generalities, but when you look at a lot of successful artists, um, you study them. And when you go to their studios, not all, some, um, they use the same materials over and over and over again. And what they, they are called masters, they are not called experiment, experiment, experimenters yeah they don't go to their studio to constantly experiment with new art supplies they go to their studio to master uh, create a masterpiece how do you create a masterpiece how do you become a master you become one with your supplies if you're constantly buying new art supplies you're never going to become one with your supplies i know this is very controversial and a lot of people don't agree with me and i'm cool with that you do not have to agree with me because if you're just an amateur artist and, um, yeah, if, if you're just an amateur artist and you're doing this for fun and it's a hobby for you, then experiment, 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 experiment. But if your intentions are to become a professional and, you know, get paid doing this and um, create a name for yourself in the art world, you don't want to, yeah. You want to become one with your materials. So what do we have here so far? Let, let's take a backtrack. Um, what, what we have is different things have different values. Okay. So we've made the land and the houses. Yeah, for me, I just, you know... Um, I keep it simple and, and I like repetition. Repetition is the mother of skill for me. So I, I've become one with this color race pencil. Now I, I introduced this color race pencil to my students and I'm sorry for sounding repetitive, but this is relevant. Um, 
I, I tell my students right off the bat, I'm like, listen, there are better pencils than the Colorase pencil for an all around pencil. But for me, this is what I like. Try it. You might like it. You may hate it. You And some people just stick with their tried and true mechanical pencil. Some people look, look at this piece of um, fallen tree over here, how it's pointing towards the background. Okay, it needs to be higher than what I have there, but it's all good. Okay, so we have some debris here, maybe from the fallen, some branches off of that tree that looks like it it's halfway dead. Um, we have some lot four chickens. So I'm starting to now curve my pencil strokes here with the lay of the land. See what I'm doing? I'm going with the lay of the land this way because this is a hill. We have a cast shadow from the tree on the ground that is going up the hill. Do you guys see that? That's really important. We have this big branch, shadow side of the branch, and shadow side of the dwelling. Yes, it is okay to use one medium once you've taken time to experiment. So for me, I experimented in first, second, and third year of college. Once fourth year of college came, I said, okay, it, the, I've got to stop experimenting. I just need to pick one medium and start to master it. Okay, now let's, um, so I, I like that side of the painting. It's working for me. And uh, let me try to go a little bit faster because we're into this uh, an hour and 11 minutes. So let's say I'm going to go for maybe like another 10, 15 minutes and we'll call this one done. Cool. Uh, let's see here. So this is very dark. So now this dwelling is very dark. You know, it, it's, it's, um, it's a big challenge for me not to make the proportions perfect. And I'm just letting everything go. It's very sharp, this dwelling right over here. Very sharp. Okay. And it's all in shadow. Squinting. Squint at this so you get the values correct. See, I'm holding my pencil. I'm holding it a little differently now so I can press down a little bit harder. We, this is very horizontal, that cast shadow, because it's on flat land. But this cast shadow is not horizontal because it's on a hill a small little hill that starts to wrap down like that. Okay. Now this is a hill, a little hill that goes into this little gully where we see these wagon ruts from the wheels. So let's get that rut in. Let's get this rut in because this is our journey. So every landscape in my opinion should have a journey that the artist takes the viewer on. Oops. Yep. So this is very thick over here in the foreground, that rut. And now we have this very, very harsh cast shadow. So you see my head is bobbing up and down, up and down, up and down. I'm really trying to go a little bit faster for you. Okay, and there's a cast shadow right over here. That's going in perspective. Um, draw what you see versus drawing what you know. It depends on your end game and your style. So if your style is to do a, a realistic representation of the model on the model and stand, you draw what you see. If you're a cartoonist or a fine artist who likes to draw out of your imagination and that creates the bulk of your body of work, well, then you draw what you know. So for me, everything is hyper dependent upon your style and your style should be your signature style and it should be consistent. This is the biggest dilemma a lot of art students have is picking a style. <laughs> um, yep. Because some people have more than one style and they can't decide which one is for them. And I, I would never want to be cursed with that because uh, that is a curse. Because uh, I, I, I've been teaching for so many years and there are people who have a style that is very intuitive and very innate. 
And then there are students that don't have a style. Like every single piece of art they do looks different. And they spend a big chunk of their artistic journey discovering what their style is. And some people never find it. And they're in constant experimentation mode. And that is a huge hindrance to their um, improvement path. Hope that made sense. Okay, so this tree, I'm just going to represent it. It has a horizontal cast shadow. Let's just put some branches in. At the end of the branches, there's like big chunks of... Um, okay, so do you see how I need to go darker over here? Um, Bats, what was the question? Aurora at Aurora. I don't know if you got an answer to your question, but I know that the streams usually stay up on YouTube. So basically how the streams work is whatever I stream on YouTube stays on YouTube. And I also put it in the members area. But what I always do, and I don't know if I'm going to do it. This might be the first Saturday that I don't do it is I always film like exclusive videos after I do the live stream for members of DTO and I put them in the members area. So the first live stream, like I said, always goes on YouTube. Uh, and then I, I do additional videos after the live stream for members and those videos go within the members area of drawingtutorialsonline.com and they're made into a mini course. Yes, I hope I hope I answered that question. So once again, just let me repeat that. Uh, this first live stream stays on YouTube, but then I film additional videos after the live stream solely for members of drawingtutorialsonline.com, um, and those videos go in the members area under a new course. And I usually the courses can be found on the dashboard of the website. The dashboard is there as soon as you log in, all of the courses pop up. And um, you'll see the drawing in the picture and that will be associated with that course. Okay, so do you see how wrong so many things are with this piece? <laughs> um, yes, do you see how wrong so many things are with this piece? Holy tamole. Squint. Let's raise this. You have to have a little bit of a sense of humor with this because if you don't, it can drive you cuckoo. So you have to. Um, there, there have been days that in the past where I've taken artwork and I've thrown it against the wall when I was younger um, because I didn't know what the heck I was doing. Um, and you're going to have those days. But you also want to have a little bit of a sense of humor as well. Yes, Craig, you're being very positive with me here. Okay, let's just do, let's get a sharper pencil. So l let's just do a quick um, teaching uh, thing right now. I'll do the clouds, no doubt. So... Where is our gesture, our zigzag? Where's that Verithin pencil right here? Let me resharpen it. This is our journey right here. It's journeying around. This is our journey. That's one of them. There's many journeys in this piece because there's many footpaths. Then we, this is another journey. So there's this little path right over here in the foreground. Do you see it? And this thing takes us around the hill, up this path, across to the midground to these huts, these dwellings, and then we follow the dwellings to this far distant aspect of the piece. Okay, so that's number one. We have multiple journeys going on, and there's a lot of things in perspective in this piece. This fallen branch that I need to use my eraser to lighten it 
points us into the background. These fallen branches, which are these little mini logs that are probably going to be used to build another dwelling, are pointing us into the background. Okay, uh, There's actually this here that I'm sketching that's wrapping around this hill is in perspective and it wraps around and it points us into the background. This roof line brings us down in perspective to the background. So there's tons and tons and tons of journey lines. Uh, the zigzag could be zig, zag, zig, zag. Okay, you have to go with me on that, but it's there. That is in every piece. Different things have different values. The land is a different value than the sky. The light is definitely coming from this side, okay, the, the right side of the piece. Um, this tree that we see here in, in the foreground uh, pops out a lot f for me, but I keep going to this really dark rut. Why am I going there? I can't tell you why, but I just am. I keep going here. I, I guess I can tell you that it's contrasty because if I take the mono zero eraser right over here, there's a little bit of light in that foreground, which is so cool. There's light over here, and that is really attracting my eye for whatever reason. It's very contrasty, very hard edged. Okay, and even over here, it's very contrasty. It's much more contrasty than that tree. Okay, and that this cast shadow over here is very dark, and that helps us go into our journey. So there's so many things. If we go back to our list from this one, so we talked about the frame. You always want to draw the exact size frame, which I didn't do. The lay of the land, the values of each lay of the land, the value structure of your piece. Take the viewer on a journey and think about contrast. You can't have contrast everywhere. You've got to limit where you put the contrast. So now I would go over this whole thing and make it a little less contrasty. Okay, this tree is not white like the sky. I'm going to do the clouds next, I promise. Um, the clouds are really very easy. It's just more about the sky and not about the clouds. Now there's this beautiful, these beautiful branches. So branches are affected by gravity. And, and the longer the branches get, the more they droop down, okay? That's something that will really add a nice touch to your tree drawings and paintings, okay? And they get thinner uh, as they go further and further and further in away from the trunk of the tree. You know, this seems very logical and obvious, but a lot of people make their branches straight and uh, almost like a sword, and they don't droop with gravity. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So this is somewhere, I think this is in, um, it says here, village, boy, my Russian, I don't know Russian, near Zveningorod, something like that. Um, yeah. All right, Aries, I got it. Um, thank you for joining. I, I'm going to be finishing it up soon. Yeah, I don't expect you guys to stay with me the whole time, but once I start this, I've got to kind of bring it to fruition here. Okay, so now let's talk about the clouds, because I know you guys, um, clouds are, are a thing. Uh, I just got to let all the things that are wrong with this leave it, and I maybe I'll work a little bit after, no doubt. So my clouds, it's just, these are those really beautiful types of clouds that are very poofy. Okay. Yep. I have, I think, no, I don't, maybe I do, maybe I don't. That might be in the process course uh, at the website. So if you go to the process course uh, in the underpainting part or the underdrawing part, I, I talk about the board and uh, I might have that there. 
I'll talk about that in, in a moment. Um, so now with the sky, I'm going to use my eraser shortly. So the sky... has to be very light. So I'm, I'm barely holding the pencil here. So again, I know I'm really repetitive, but again, I, I feel from teaching for all of these years, this is what I see people struggle with the most. You must make the sky the solid value. These clouds over here would have the hardest edge because they're in the background. Now, let's take the eraser and let's pull out some lights. Okay, so with the clouds, very light over here. I'm going to make this lighter. It's actually those clouds are a little bit darker. So let's pull out. I don't think I'm going to render these clouds just because of time, but this is the beginning of it. Okay. Uh, now, the ground just needs to be so much darker. So I could use the brush, but let's put more pencil down. Um, much darker here. Much darker with this hut. Let's draw some pencil strokes that go with the lay of the land. Much darker here and much taller here. See what I'm doing? I'm, I'm really going faster now. This is a good way to do your sketches. So if you're going to do a painting of this scene, I would most definitely do a sketch with the values like this. Okay? Uh, I think it would just help you tr dramatically. Now there's all these branches over here. It's really creating like this chaos. There's a little skinny tree with no leaves. Lay of the land. Lay of the land. So with paint, this would be done. Process course under drawing part. Yeah, so J Dana, just as I'm shading, I would not use white charcoal on this white paper. I only use white charcoal when I'm drawing on uh, painted illustration board or toned paper but you could experiment with it, no doubt. Uh, so Dana, basically, in, in a nutshell, with the cutting of the illustration board, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a skill all unto itself. And you want to get what is called a utility knife from like Home Depot, Lowe's, or a hardware store that has a significant blade in it, not like a little skinny razor blade, um, because you need to have something to grab onto. And when you try to cut the four ply illustration board, you need to do it in like maybe seven passes. So you hold your ruler with your hands like this, like your thumb and, and your pointer finger far apart, and you press that ruler down and you glide that razor blade over it once, over it a second time, over it a third time with gradual pressure. You know, you have to be very careful because you can cut your finger right off. If, if you try to do that, cut that board in one fell swoop, um, it's not going to work. Like, you're, you're not going to cut it with one cut. It needs to be at least several passes with the razor blade to cut that illustration board because it's, it's, it's really dense paper. Now, um... Hey, Raphael. I don't know if I have it in that course, but I do talk about the board. You just, you can skim through the video and you'll see. Okay, so hopefully you learned something here today about doing landscapes with those principles. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, definitely wouldn't use the white charcoal on this paper. I still, I, I could still sit here for another hour and put pencil down. You got it, Dana. So very horizontal over here. There's a little perspective involved. Okay, so I'm being a little aggressive. 
I never break pencils like this, but I'm trying to do this in a hurry for you guys. How do you make sure your colors are the same as your values? Well, yeah. Um, let me see if I have something here to talk about. One of the most important skills for you to have is to be able to do this process. So to be able to do a black and white and then to be able to do a color where the values are matched. And it's very hard to match values in color. It really is. And this is when I was learning how to do it. And it's not exact to say by any stretch of the imagination. But that's how you learn. Like you do... If you're doing a, an illustration, you do a study in values and then you do a study in color and you try to match the values. And you, the only way that you can do that is if you put them side by side. Now, this was a rush job, but side by side, it's kind of the same values. Do you have any plans to put the clouds in some way? Um, the clouds, let's, let me try. So with these clouds, I'm going to hold my pencil this way, and I'm just going to use a circular motion. Yeah, totally. Um, it would, yeah, Nancy, yes. The answer is yes. So this is the side of the cloud that's catching. Um, thank you, Aurora. This is the side of the cloud that is catching shadow. And my paper is all messed up over here. Th this is a lower-lying cloud. So the whole, this is a different value. So right now I'm just using a circular pencil stroke and I'm trying to be very, very light with my touch. And my paper is all smudged over here so it's never going to be perfect. Very light. And then down over here the horizon clouds are a little darker than the clouds that are higher that are catching tons of sunlight. Okay, there's, as your clouds get close to the horizon line, they become horizontal. There's so many things wrong with this piece, but we're calling it a teaching piece. This, um, you just, yeah, I'm going too dark. Everything's too dark, and I, I'm just trying to make this a, a little bit more complicated. I, I could do a whole class just even on clouds. I'm just using continuous line, very light pressure. Now this is a cloud that's coming into the foreground and it's extremely light. Now if I wasn't such a brute in the beginning, I could erase out a little bit more, but next to the where the sunlight is hitting these clouds, this just needs to be more solid so there's no confusion. It's just everything is about values. For me. Doesn't have to be for you, but for me it is. Now we have a little bit of a darker cloud over here. See it? Dark is a relative term. It's very light. I gotta be careful I don't go too dark with the sky. Okay, so we are an hour and a half in. So let me just say that I'm going to work on this for like maybe two or three more minutes. And I would like to answer any final questions you guys might have in the last two to three minutes of this live stream. Because I, I want to save a little bit of this to work on it afterwards for a video for members of DTO. And we've gone an hour and a half, so I know that you guys are probably done with this. Yeah, this was fun. I enjoyed it. I, I really, you know, the thing with that's very different uh, with landscape drawing. With landscape drawing, it's just, a, for me, it's a lot of shapes have to be filled in, and that's what just takes forever. And it's it may not be like must-see TV, um, watching me shade in all of these shapes. You got it, Michelle. Thank you so much. I, I, Michelle, I love your name. It just kind of rolls off of the tongue. 
Michelle Lacanto. It's a very nice name. There was another um, student that I had many years ago. She was from the Philippines, and um, her name was Michelle, and I forgot her last name, but it just rolled right off of the tongue. That was so long ago. She was so cool. Okay, so I'm just erasing out the chickens. <laughs> Can't leave the chickens there. The, the people need to have an egg sandwich in the morning. So funny. If I could come on in here, I mean, the, the pencil, the paper's kind of destroyed. Now, um, when I go to the uh, next video that I'm going to film right after this live stream, you got it, Michelle. Thank you, Nancy. I'm going to use this um, white India ink pen just for fun. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to film that. So with this white India ink pen, I'm going to do the little chickens. I'm going to do some stuff with the clouds. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. Uh, so that's where I'm going to go take this next. I'm going to take a little break, step away. And I just want to thank you guys so much for joining me here today. If you have any suggestions for future um, live stream classes, please email me. My email is email at drawing-tutorials-online.com, and I will get that email. Uh, you can just click on the contact uh, on my website, and it should send it to me. Sometimes they go to my junk mail. If they go to my junk mail, then just keep, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, if you're a member, ask me to do something in, in the forums. That will not go to my uh, junk mail. So, You got it. Thank you. Thank you guys for joining. I really appreciate it. I hope those five things that you use them uh, in your drawings. And then last but not least, uh, try to do one of these landscapes and put it in the critique gallery at, at DTO so I can critique it for you on Monday. A couple people have been doing that and it's been so good. Okay. So yeah, you got it, Luke, Ileana, Liz, David. Phoenix, thank you, thank you, thank you, guys. Don't everyone buy that sharpener. I might want to buy one myself. Save one for me on eBay, okay? All right, guys, I'll talk to you. Thanks, James. I'll see you guys later. Thanks, Ileana.